Hello and welcome to this episode of This Is Your Life. My name is Michael Hyatt and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership. My goal is to help you live with more passion, work with greater focus, and lead with extraordinary influence. In this episode, I'll be talking about how to coach your boss. Lots has been written on the topic of coaching employees. One of my favorites is Becoming a Coaching Leader by my friend Daniel Harkavy. But very little has been written on the topic of coaching your boss. And in this episode, I'll share eight ways to approach this without jeopardizing your job. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Platform University, an online membership site for helping you launch your personal platform or take it to the next level. You can find out more at platformuniversity.com. And if you're already a member, be sure and check out the new masterclass we posted earlier this week. In it, I interview WordPress guru Andrew Buckman, and we talk about the 10 most common mistakes people make in blogging. So again, check us out at platformuniversity.com. Well, I thought I'd start this episode with a quick report. I'm fresh back off my annual sabbatical. Gail and I spent the month of July in Buena Vista, Colorado, and yes, that's how they say it out west, but I thought I'd give you a little report on how it went. First, the setting was absolutely glorious. We were at 9,000 feet on the side of Mount Columbia, and we had a nice little trout pond and a hiking trail about a half a mile from the cabin. But the reason we went was mostly to unplug and focus on a couple of big creative projects. And I wanted to write my next book, which is called The Life Plan Manifesto, which I'm also doing with Daniel Harkavy, whom I mentioned earlier. Gail just wanted to do some painting and practice her drawing skills, do a little reading, mostly just relax. But here's how the typical day went. We got up at about 5 a.m., which is our usual time, and we would have our quiet times alone. And then about 8 o'clock or so, we'd hike up the mountain on this beautiful trail along a mountain stream. And it was usually about 60 degrees by this time. The trail was filled with wildflowers, absolutely gorgeous. The hike would take us about an hour. Then we'd come back, shower, and eat breakfast. And then I would sit down and write from about 10 a.m. till 1 p.m., about three hours. Then we'd break for lunch, and sometimes we'd fix something at the cabin. Occasionally, we'd drive into town. And then I would, of course, take, you guessed it, a nap. And I wrote about this in The Five Reasons Why You Should Take a Nap Every Day. I'm a firm believer in this, and I made the case on my blog. I've got a link in the show notes. But usually by this time, it would be raining almost every afternoon. Perfect. It only lasted about an hour or two, but it was perfect for taking a nap. Then I'd start writing again at about uh, 3 p.m. and write straight through till about 6, so another three hours, and that gave me six solid hours of writing every day, which is about my limit. But meanwhile, Gail would be painting or reading, and then we'd break for dinner. Now, again, same drill. We'd either cook something at the cabin or we'd drive into town, and some evenings we went fishing and grilled fresh trout. We literally could pull them out of the lake clean them, and would be eating them in less than an hour. And that's what I call fresh fish. Awesome. Well, then every single night, we would watch two to three episodes of Friday Night Lights on Netflix. We got totally hooked. A friend of ours recommended this series to us, and we love it. In fact, we're still watching it at home right now. We're on season three. Season two is a little slow, but it's worth powering through to get to season three. But great writing, great acting. And the funny thing about this, if you knew me, is that we never watch TV and neither one of us are football fans. But the writing and the acting in this show is just so unbelievable that we're captivated. We can't wait to watch the next show. And in fact, we talk about the characters like they were our friends. It's crazy. But I did finish the first draft of my manuscript on the last day in the cabin at 6 p.m., not a day too soon. And there are a few things that I still got left to tweak. And I've got the first draft to get off to Daniel so that He could look at it and, of course, add his own content to it. But there's a few things that we would do differently next year on our sabbatical, like, for starters, not launch a premium WordPress theme in the middle of it, which we did this time with the Get Notice theme. But all in all, we had a fabulous time. This is one of the things that we're committed to as a couple. And frankly, one of the great things about having a platform like I do and having 90% of my business on the internet is that I can work from literally anywhere. It's really really a blessing. But now let's move to our tip of the week. And you know it's inevitable. Sooner or later, your hard drive will fail or you'll accidentally delete a file you meant to keep. 
And as a corollary to Murphy's Law, it will happen at the worst possible time. I promise you it's happened to me. It's going to happen to you. You know, it's going to be the day you finish writing a long report or a manuscript, you know, finish the presentation, you're completing your annual budget, something is going to go wrong and your computer is going to crash. My tip is this, make sure you have a solid computer backup system before you need it. And don't learn this the hard way. There's lots of easy solutions out there. In fact, I use three. Okay. I know I'm a little paranoid, but I've been here before and I don't like being caught without a backup. So first of all, I just use Time Machine on my Mac to back up everything to an airport time capsule, which is Apple's wireless router plus a wireless hard drive. And I use this at home. Number two, I use a, a piece of software called SuperDuper to back up everything onto an external hard drive. And I happen to use the G Drive mobile, which you can find at Amazon or anyplace else. But I use this at the office. And then I use Crash Plan to back up everything to the cloud. And I've got links to all this software in the show notes. But this is great because it backs up wirelessly to the cloud and it backs up incrementally. The first one takes forever. I mean, several days. But after that, it just runs, uh, you know, I think it runs like every hour on the hour and it just adds to it whatever I've done in the last hour. So it's always up to date. So this helps me sleep at night because if my computer were to crash, I literally could be back up and running as quickly as I could get another computer. But I explained a little bit more in a post I wrote some time ago called How to Set Up a Crash-Proof Backup System for Your Mac. Again, there's a link in the show notes. You can find that at michaelhyatt.com slash backup. So let's get into how to coach your boss. The truth is, most employees see things that their boss says or does that are ineffective or inefficient. And sometimes they see these things more clearly than anyone else does. And the boss could profit a ton from the inside of his or her subordinates if only they could get honest feedback. And speaking as a former CEO, this is one of the things I found very difficult to get. Too often people told me what they thought I wanted to hear And I had a handful of people who were willing to take the risk and tell me exactly what they thought. These people were very, very precious to me and they became trusted advisors. The problem is that most people are scared to correct their boss or offer advice. They're afraid they're going to be punished or at the very least given a cold shoulder. And I know that's not always true, but a lot of people think that and therefore they'd rather not say anything. Well, the best bosses welcome criticism. And they know that the shortest distance between where they are and where they want to be is the truth. And they create a safe environment where people can freely speak their mind. And let me just go a little bit off topic here for a minute. If you're a leader, are you creating an environment that is safe for criticism, safe for dissent, safe to approach you and share with you the kinds of things that you will only get from people who observe you closely? If you are, good. Congratulations to you. If you're not, I would really encourage you to work on this. Create a safe environment where people feel okay to share this kind of stuff. Let me just tell you, in creating a safe environment, and I'm not going to do a whole episode on this, but in creating a safe environment, you've got to welcome this kind of thing. Uh, You've got to smile when they're talking. And I had a problem with this for years because I didn't naturally smile. I looked kind of gruff, uh, looked, uh, I don't know, condescending or like maybe I was judging them. You know, not exactly conducive to them being forthcoming with the information. So with a little coaching, I was able to fix that. And I remember one time sitting in a meeting when someone was sharing with me some bad news about their division. And I had a consultant who worked with me at the time. And at the break, she pulled me aside and she said, are you angry? And I said, no. And she said, well, you look like you're ticked off in that meeting. In fact, it looked like you were really angry at the guy that was talking and wanted to take his head off. And I said, oh my gosh, well, my heart's definitely not wired up to uh, my mouth or my facial expressions because that's not how I felt. And she just said, well, look, you got to work on that because that's not going to give you the results that you want in terms of communication and getting the feedback you need to run this company. And she was exactly right. But let's go back to the situation of coaching your boss. What if you're not sure about your boss? What if you're afraid you're going to jeopardize your career by speaking up? Well, here are a few things to consider when attempting to offer advice to your supervisor and also provide a couple of examples of how I would do it when I'm in that situation or if I'm in that situation. Number one, check the weather. 
You know, bosses are people too. They've got families, they pay bills, they struggle with the same things you do, and they probably have a boss as well. I know that's hard to believe, but I, I know people thought that as a CEO, I was like the top guy, but I had a boss. In fact, I had eight bosses. They were my board members, but I had good days and bad, and so does your boss. And sometimes they're going to be more receptive to input than others. So you've got to find a time when the boss is not in a bad mood or distracted by other things and can really focus on you. And this takes some emotional intelligence. Uh, you've got to be alert to the signals. And if they're just not up for it, if you don't think they're going to be receptive and it can wait, then I would pass and find a time that's better. And I did that on many occasions with bosses that I've had through the years. Time means everything. Number two, be humble. You know, don't correct your boss out of anger. That's never going to serve you and it's definitely not going to serve them. Don't correct them out of pride. Instead, acknowledge that both of you are human. He or she has faults. Uh, just like you do. And the reason you're on the same team is so you can help each other. And I think if you approach it that way, as one human to another human, one struggler to another struggler, you'll get much further than if you think, you know, you're a little bit indignant or you're offended or you're angry. That's not really going to work for you. Number three, start with praise. And this is really common sense in any kind of human interaction, but particularly with your boss. You know, most people can hear criticism, at least my experience has been that. Most people can hear criticism if they know they're loved and accepted. And offering a genuine compliment is a good way to start a difficult conversation. But beware, you've got to be authentic. Otherwise, it's going to feel like manipulation. And we've all had these experiences where people, you know, kind of sucker punch us. They come up and they give us this, you know, kind of uh, a lush compliment and we fall for it, and then they hit us, and it hurts. And it feels like manipulation. It feels like they were only trying to get on our good side so that they could deliver the bad news. So don't be guilty of that. Be authentic, but start with a compliment. Number four, ask for permission. This can really help you. You might say something like, hey, there's something I'd like to share with you that I think would really be helpful to both of us, but I want to make sure I have your permission to speak openly. And then pause. It's really difficult for the boss to take offense if he or she has given you permission to proceed. So I would recommend, if you have any doubt, make sure you've got that before you share any criticism. Number five, put it in context. You know, one of the best things you can do to help your boss understand uh, is how his behavior or her behavior is keeping him or her from accomplishing their goals. For example, you might say, I know collaboration is one of your highest values, but when you cut me off in mid-sentence, it makes me want to withdraw and not participate. It's really honest, and it's in context. Or you could say something like, you know, you've always encouraged me to set high goals and believe in myself, but when you snap at me like that, I feel small and want to give up. And by the way, these are not hypothetical conversations. These are real conversations that I've had in the past with real bosses. And I think to be honest and develop a reputation with your boss of being honest can be enormously uh, helpful to you and to your career. Number six, assume the best. You know, I don't know too many bosses that get up in the morning with the goal of making their employees miserable. In fact, I don't know one. But they're most likely clueless about the behavior that is driving you crazy. It's more of, a, of an issue of incompetence than malice. If they knew about it, they would correct it. And you've got to assume they'll change once they have the benefit of your perspective and input. It was kind of like the story I told earlier about the consultant talking to me. I was clueless. I wasn't trying to create fear. I wasn't trying to intimidate that employee. My face just wasn't wired up to my heart or my mind and was giving the wrong signals. And I would have had no way of knowing that unless I was looking in the mirror when I was talking or I had a trusted advisor who was willing to take the risk and tell me the truth. It ended up being good for me. It was good for the employee. It was good for the company. So you've got to uh, assume the best. Number seven, believe that it matters. This is so important. You know, it's not an accident that you are working for this person at this time and are noticing this behavior. You know, maybe, just maybe, God has placed you in this person's life to help them grow. Um, some of the very best counsel I've ever received came from my subordinates. And if you don't speak up, 
Who will? I mean, you're going to deprive them of getting the very information they need to succeed, not only as your supervisor, but maybe even for the company or the organization you work for to succeed. So if you've seen it, believe that you have a stewardship to share it. Obviously, in the right context, in the right situation, being humble and all the other things that I've shared, but believe that it matters because it does, maybe more than you know. Number eight, take the risk. You know, speaking out takes courage, and you're never going to grow into the leader you were meant to be if you're not willing to take a risk and occasionally speak up. I can't uh, emphasize this enough. Courage is at the essence of being a good leader, and people that are afraid to speak up, frankly, are not going to demonstrate or not going to realize or develop their full capacity as a leader. Being a suck-up will not get you promoted. And even if it does, you're not going to be effective in that role because you're not going to have the courage to be effective. Being courageous, though, eventually will get you promoted so long as it's done in the right spirit. You know, as a boss myself, I consider it an expression of loyalty when my people talk directly to me rather than about me. And I know I've got faults. I want to grow. And you can help me and your own boss by taking the initiative to speak up. I hope that's been helpful, and I'll be back in a minute with our listener Q&A segment. Welcome back. Since I was out on my sabbatical, I only had one question. I didn't really give people time to ask questions, but it's an important one. And it comes from Joanna Holman. Hi, Michael. My name's Joanna Holman, and I'm calling from Melbourne, Australia. I write at joannamuses.com. My question is, how do I go about coaching a very accomplished boss or senior colleague on a topic that's outside their area of expertise in a way that shows respect for their status and their expertise in other things? Uh, Thanks for your help. Joanna, this is a great question, and this has happened to me occasionally, and I would say that the main thing you need to do, in addition to the eight uh, suggestions that I made earlier, being humble and put it in context, make sure the weather's right, all that stuff, I would try to to lead with the facts. Try to objectify it. Don't make it emotional. Make it very much fact-based, and uh, demonstrate your own expertise by citing the facts. Don't show them off. Don't shame them. Don't try to make them look stupid. But just lay the facts out so that it becomes a very objective decision. And one of the things that I've done in the past is not get emotionally attached to an outcome so that, uh, so that I can let them decide and give them the pros and the cons, the pluses and the minuses so that they can see whatever the issue is we're discussing. Even if it's about them, help them see objectively uh, where they are. So I hope that helps. But now for the rest of you listening, it's your turn. Do you need to sit down with your boss and have a conversation? Well, how can I help you? What questions do you still have? To comment on this episode, go to my blog at michaelhyatt.com slash 61, as in episode 61, and I'll be back in a minute with some announcements and a final action step for you to take in coaching your boss. Don't close your I have a few quick announcements and then a final tip as you think about talking to your boss. Number one, if you're considering launching your own platform or just getting serious about it, you need to start with a self-hosted WordPress blog. It's not as complicated as it sounds. In fact, I've put together a step-by-step screencast on exactly how to do it. You don't need any technical knowledge. I walk you through the entire process in exactly 20 minutes. And by the way, I just updated this screencast this past week, so it has the latest and the greatest information available. The screencast is absolutely free. You can find it at michaelhyatt.com slash WordPress setup. There's also a link in the show notes. Second announcement, the SCORE conference for this fall is filling up very quickly. Whether you're a professional speaker or just wanna be, this conference will teach you how to prepare with focus 
deliver with confidence, and speak with power. We have had literally thousands of students go through this over the years. And honestly, this conference has had a bigger impact on my career than any conference I've ever attended. It revolutionized my speaking. It's influenced every aspect of my communication, including my blogging and my podcasting. Well, my business partner, Ken Davis, who originally developed the SCORE conference, and I will be hosting this fall's conference on October 14 through 17 at the beautiful Sebastian Hotel in Vail, Colorado. And if you're serious about becoming a better speaker, you simply must attend. And you can find out more at scoreconference.tv. All one word, score with two R's, scoreconference.tv. Now get this, you can use the discount HYATT, all caps, H-Y-A-T-T, use the special discount code HYATT and take $200 off the registration price. But this offer expires on August the 15th, 2013, so you need to act quickly. Third announcement. Finally, my next podcast will be on three reasons you can't afford high-maintenance clients and what you should do if you've got one. Ever been there? I have, and I'm going to tell you all about it, and I promise this episode will be super practical. If you've got a question about that topic or you have a high-maintenance client, Leave me a voicemail message at michaelhyatt.com slash podcast question. This is a terrific way to cross-promote your blog or website because I'll link to it just like I did with the callers in this episode, and you'll see that even in the show notes. So now let me leave you with one final tip when it comes to coaching your boss. Never, and I mean ever, speak badly of your boss behind their back. This is a huge temptation, I know, but it's also cowardly. I don't know how else to say it. And I promise your boss will find out. They have uh, a way about them and some way of finding that out. When you know in your heart that you are loyal, it gives you the moral authority and the courage to follow through in private when you need to. Don't lose this. Don't compromise it by giving in in to the temptation to gossip. All you would do is undermine your own authority with your boss, with your subordinates, and with yourself. Well, that's about it for this episode of This Is Your Life. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please show the love by going to michaelhyatt.com slash love and tweeting a link to the show. I'd be so grateful that will help us get the word out. And if you'd like to comment on this episode, again, please go to michaelhyatt.com slash 061 is in episode 61.